Okay, give me just one more second and we will get started. Okay, I think that you are good to go, Tony. Thank you, Alan. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for uh, uh, joining us today. Uh, speaking first for myself and for Bob Howarth, we would like to uh, follow up on Ted's introductory comments and, and laud uh, the White House and especially the National Climate Assessment Team out of the White House uh, for publication just recently uh, a very important scientific accurately, scientifically accurate and politically brave document, uh, Climate Change Impacts in the United States. And we'd also like to acknowledge uh, that the White House is, in fact, now finally taking seriously uh, the issues revolving methane, shale gas, and shale oil development and climate change, as evidenced by their recent publication of the Climate Action Plan Strategy to Reduce Methane Emissions. Uh, our purpose today in meeting with you is to point out what we think are some shortcomings in that Climate Action Plan to Reduce Methane Emissions and why those shortcomings create uh, disconnects between these two notable documents. So I'm going to hand off to uh, Dr. Howarth next, and he's going to detail those shortcomings. Uh, and then he'll hand back to me after a few minutes, and we'll show you some um, evidences of methane emissions that are currently not being accounted for. And then we'll open up to Q&A from you, the participants. So thank, thank you. Bob, you're up. Thank you, Tony, Alan, and Ted. Um, pleased to be able to uh, talk with you today. Just a bit of a technical challenge here while I get the yeah. things through there. I want to very briefly bring you up to date on the new science which has happened since our paper that Tony, uh, Renee Santor, and I published three years ago on methane and the greenhouse gas footprint of natural gas and shale gas. Of course, one of the major important changes is the new IPCC assessment, which has come out last fall and, and, and this spring. They've clearly stated that humans are causing global warming and that we're seeing the uh, each of the last three decades has consecutively been the warmest yet, and the national climate assessment uh, further addressed that. One important point of the IPCC assessment is, is their highlighting of methane. They talk a great deal more about methane now than in the last assessment from 2007. Uh, and they point out that methane is almost as important as carbon dioxide in terms of its total radiative warming on Earth, one watt per square meter as opposed to 1.66 for carbon dioxide. There's also been a lot of new science over the last uh, year or two, in particular, on measuring methane emissions from the natural gas industry, from shale gas and from conventional natural gas, both upstream at well streams uh, and a little bit downstream, mostly upstream at the, uh, at the well sites. I've summarized uh, that in a paper that's being published in Energy Science and Engineering uh, this month. And what I'm showing you next are a few uh, figures from that. First, this is a summary figure on some of the new information on methane emissions. Shown here are our studies from three years ago on the bottom, the bottom bars there. Red are the R estimates for conventional natural gas and for shale gas for the methane emissions at well sites, the upstream emissions there in red. And yellow would be our estimates for conventional natural gas, low and high end. The studies above that are some of the newer studies uh, showing mostly upstream emissions mostly showing emissions which are in fact higher than we had estimate. And then the top orange bars there are two studies, one from last November and one from this past February, which synthesized for the United States as a whole the best information on total emissions, upstream and downstream emissions. I think this does a good job. These are better data than we had available to us when we published our paper, uh, but I'm pleased to say that they agreed uh, quite well with what we had surmised from the poorer quality data we had available them. Methane emissions are indeed high. I think the best emission data out there now for the United States as a whole are from the Brant et al. paper, which gives a range of 3.6 to 7.1 percent, a mean of 5.4 percent. In contrast to that, the Environmental Protection Agency last year decreased their estimate of methane emissions for the United States. They took it down to 1.8 percent. And Miller et al. clearly demonstrated and concluded that that estimate was too low 
the science is showing it's probably far too low. I'll come back to that in a minute. In addition to looking at the extent of methane emissions, we need to put methane in the context with carbon dioxide, and that requires a, a time frame of reference. A lot of researchers who were critical of our initial study said we had to focus just on looking at a 100-year century time scale, and that's because methane's influence dissipates after the first uh, decade or three after its emission. The IPCC has weighed in explicitly on that and says there's no scientific reason to focus simply on 100 years compared to other choices, and that you should choose a time frame that's dependent on the science question you are posing. Since we published our paper three years ago, I've become more convinced. We looked at both 20 and 100 year time periods originally. I'm far more convinced today that the shorter time period is, is the critical one. And the largest piece of evidence for that, the, the science which has convinced me, is the work of Drew Schindel from NASA Goddard Space. This came out in Science two years ago. It's been endorsed by the United Nations as well. What it shows is the global warming over most of the 20th century and then three or four potential scenarios into the future. The first, the green line there, the reference scenario, is what warming the planet will happen if we control uh, no greenhouse gas emissions. And we'll hit a 1.5 degree temperature in about 15 to 17 years from now, two degrees in about 35 years from now. If we control carbon dioxide emissions but ignore methane and other radiatively active substances, we have the same warming trend for most of the next 30 to 35 years because of time lags in the climate system. Whereas if we control methane, even if we ignore carbon dioxide, we gain a huge benefit in slowing the rate of global warming. And of course we want to do both long term. But methane is the low hanging fruit in terms of addressing the immediacy of global warming. We need to avoid hitting those temperatures of 1.5 to 2 degrees over the next few, cent next few decades because of the danger, the risk of hitting tipping points in the, in the climate system and getting runaway global warming. Those risks become quite real at one and a half to two degrees Celsius. Again, from the IPCC assessment, they looked at total global emissions of greenhouse gases under human control, and they looked at different time frames, a 10-year frame, the 20-year frame, and a 100-year frame. And what I want you to see here is on the left-hand side, if you take this shorter time frame, the IPCC is now telling us that methane emissions, when expressed as carbon dioxide equivalents, at that shorter time frame, actually equal or exceed carbon dioxide emissions. Methane is no small player in this. The IPCC has several times changed their uh, estimates for global warming potential. That's a factor by which you multiply the, math, the mass of methane to compare it with carbon dioxide. It's always higher at the shorter time frame because methane dissipates in the atmosphere over time. But over time, the IPCC has been increasing their values. These are the latest values, 86 for 20 years, 34 for 100 year time period. And again, I'd like to note that the Environmental Protection Agency today is still using only a 100 year value and only from the IPCC assessment from 1996. They're not using the best and latest science they are not taking the advice of the latest IPCC assessment. And the result is that they are underestimating the influence of methane for any emission rate by 1.5 fold at the 100 year time frame, uh, up to fourfold if we look at the shorter time frame, which I think is absolutely critical. So we throw those two factors together and EPA is underestimating the extent of methane emissions from the oil and gas industry probably by at least twofold, perhaps more, according to the Miller et al. study from last November. And they're using a global warming potential that's badly out of date, looking only at the 100-year time period. And you combine those two factors, and EPA is underestimating the significance of methane emissions from the gas industry in the United States by up to eightfold, perhaps even more, seriously underestimating the extent of the problem. Let me show you a couple more slides here to, to sum up. Uh, again, this is from my new summary paper, updating our paper from three years ago. We're now comparing the greenhouse gas footprint of natural gas, diesel, oil, and coal per normalized the amount of heat energy that's generated as the fuel is burned initially. The yellow shows the direct carbon dioxide emissions, and here natural gas has fewer emissions than diesel, oil, or coal. But the red is the methane equivalents uh, in global warming expressed as carbon dioxide equivalents. We're using that best estimate out of the February 2004 Brant et al. study. I'm showing the uncertainty associated with that in the whisker bars there. And you can see that natural gas has an unacceptably high greenhouse gas footprint compared to these other fossil fuels. That's for direct combustion 
just to generate heat. We can also look at how the gas or how the coal, how other fuels are being used. On the left is the primary heat figure I just showed you. In the middle panel is for electricity production. And here, natural gas is still worse than coal, but not by quite as much because of uh, electric power plants fueled by natural gas are slightly more efficient than that of coal. Still, because of the methane emissions, this has an unacceptably high greenhouse gas footprint when viewed over a 20-year time period. And on the right, when you start looking at other uses of gas, most gas in the United States is used for heating. And here we're looking at the use for domestic hot water. If you have a natural gas burner in your home, as most Americans do for their hot water, that has the largest of the greenhouse gas footprints. Far preferable is the far right there, which is a high efficiency electric heat pump with electricity generated afar from coal. And of course, if you'd use solar or wind, it would be far better yet. But even coal here is better than natural gas for heating hot water. Finally, there's still uncertainty about the extent of the methane emissions for the United States, but these are still the best estimates, I think, for the country as a whole. They're older values from the Environmental Protection Agency. They indicate that the largest source of methane pollution in the atmosphere is from natural gas systems, followed by animal agriculture. Again, these are probably underestimates. And with that, I'll turn it back to my colleague, Tony Ingrafia. Thank you, Bob. I uh, just want to take a few more minutes and point out, uh, in my opinion, uh, why we're seeing a significant difference between so-called top-down measurements, as evidenced most recently, recently just this morning by another paper released from the uh, Environmental Defense Fund team, uh, and so-called bottom-up estimates uh, based on emission factors and uses. Uh, there seems to be a growing uh, difference between those. And people are scratching their heads as saying, well, why are we measuring more than we estimate? And one possible contribution is that we're not estimating everything that's leaking or being vented. There are sources of methane, substantial sources of methane, getting into the atmosphere from processes and locations that have never been accounted for, except by top-down measurement. So I'm going to show three segments, very briefly, from videos uh, giving some of those unmeasured sources. First one is uh, a video taken by a uh, private citizen driving down a road in Pennsylvania. And this shows evidence of direct venting of a substantial amount of methane directly into the atmosphere from a well that has been shut in. That is, it's been drilled, it's been fracked, but it's not yet connected to a pipeline. And because of excessive pressure, periodically, a valve is opened, and you see and hear this. Uh, the next video I want to show is uh, an example of leaking, in this case from a well that's actually in production. And I want to remind you that we have over 3.2 million oil and gas wells either in production or abandoned in North America alone. And this methane issue is not just a North American issue, it's a global issue. So there's an example of a well that's in production that is leaking methane directly into the atmosphere. I now want to show you a brief video of uh, a well that was taken out of production some years ago uh, and was seen to be leaking both methane and oil. This is in southwestern Pennsylvania. The well was recently plugged. That is, last month it was plugged. Uh, but as I'm going to show you, even though it was plugged, Hold on one sec. Even though it's plugged, uh, which means uh, dumping cement down the production casing, this well was leaking outside of the production casing, so the plugging did absolutely nothing. Uh, the well is still leaking hydrocarbons, hydrocarbon liquids, as you can see, flowing across uh, the field. And as we zoom back into the well, you'll notice the same kind of bubbling occurring around the wellhead, which is evidence of gaseous emission. This is most likely methane. So the point I'm trying to make here with these videos, if I can come back to the PowerPoint presentation, 
is that it is possible that the discrepancies that we're seeing between the actual measurements being made from top-down uh, methods and the uh, estimates being made by bottom-up is that the bottom-up isn't take into, it taking into account significant alternative sources. I'm going to leave some of the other videos, perhaps for Q&A. There are other sources I can uh, document with videos. But the point here is if you're not estimating everything, but you're measuring everything, one should expect there to be a difference. So we want to end there and point out that this notion uh, that natural gas, methane, is a, is a bridge to a sustainable, renewable energy future uh, is, as we have said so many times in so many other millers, uh, really a bridge to nowhere when we take into account the impact of methane uh, and how it is exacerbating climate change. And it is currently the major disconnect uh, between the two major documents issued by the White House over the last few weeks. So thank you for your attention. We're looking forward to your Q&A. Thank you, Tony. This is uh, Alan Septoff at Earthworks again. Um, I think we're going to try to do questions. Uh, if you just reporters, please uh, speak up and uh, give your name and affiliation and who your question is for. And if you have muted yourself previously, you'll have to unmute yourself. Um, hi, this is uh, Sharon Kelly. I'm with uh, D-Smog Blog. Um, I was wondering, uh, uh, Professor Ngoppi, you mentioned a study that was uh, released uh, by EDF this morning. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that study and uh, uh, kind of your reaction to it? Uh, Bob and I were made aware of that paper about five minutes before this webinar started. Uh, we had that brief period of time to read the press release from the Environmental Defense Fund, and the obvious thing that jumped out to us from the press release was the measurement, this is a top-down measurement, of over 4% of production of methane from that region uh, being released. And that number, of course, is totally consistent uh, with previous measurements over the last year published by researchers from NOAA um, and from various major universities around the country. So we're not surprised. But we have certainly have not had time to even read the paper and give you any detailed analysis. Bob, do you want to add? No, it's just, with, Tony's correct, we have not yet had a chance to see the paper only in the press release, but the number that's reported there, a little over 4%, is entirely consistent with that summary slide I just just showed you there's several other studies showing emissions in that kind of right now. So I think we are honing in on that's probably the reality. Thank you. Hi, this is Polly Hughes from Texas Energy Report. And um, my question is, um, what is your assessment of the regulations that have been passed in Colorado to address methane emissions and other emissions in their um, oil and gas fields, which are quite active? Go ahead. Uh, certainly motion in the right direction to uh, pass regulations statewide uh, to attempt to coerce the industry into doing the right thing. Uh, we applaud uh, the efforts in Colorado to do that, but point out that regulations are regulations. They're not necessarily actions. Point number one. Point number two, as Bob has pointed out, they're too late. Uh, methane is being emitted today, as we're seeing by this constant uh, publication, continual publication of papers actually making measurements. Methane is being emitted today at rates far higher than what would be acceptable to make it a bridge fuel. Therefore, enacting regulations that encourage the industry to spend more money fixing leaks and stopping venting are too late. Uh, we do not have the luxury of time uh, to wait for a very expansive industry involving over a thousand operators. This is not just Exxon and BP. There are thousands of operators of various sizes and, and uh, capitalization operating oil and gas operations and pipeline operations and storage operations and pipeline operations 
and public utility operations across the country. It is just not realistic to expect that in a few years, which is all we have left to do something significant, that an act that should have been cleaned up decades ago is going to be cleaned up. If I could just add to that, if you're going to regulate these emission sources, both the venting and the leaks, it presupposes that you have good information on where the venting and leaks occur. And our information on that is getting better. The studies that we've referred to here are all within the last two years, however, and still a science in its infancy. So Tony and I were co-authors on a paper that came out uh, a month or so ago in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Carlton et al. Uh, from Purdue is the lead author. One of the things we showed there is very high rates of emissions from several wells in southwestern Pennsylvania, which were still in the drilling phase, being drilled uh, towards the Marcellus Shale, but not yet in the shale, not yet hydraulically fractured. We had assumed that such wells would emit almost nothing. EPA uh, assumes that such wells it, it emit almost nothing. So that, that's a new finding. I think there are a lot of new surprises. Uh, Tony's shown you some great footage of, of some of the sources of emissions, but there are many others and probably a lot of surprises out there. How do you regulate when you don't understand the sources? Do we have other questions for Tony and Bob? Uh, going once, <laughs> going twice. Okay. Um, Tony and Bob, do you have any closing thoughts before we uh, end this call? Well, just again, we congratulate the White House and the, and the National Climate Assessment. Uh, this latest report on the severity of global warming in the United States is a huge step forward for our, our country, acknowledging that global warming is with us now, the costs are high, and it's going to become much more severe and much more disruptive in the future. Uh, what the government is still not getting right is, is the need to control methane. So the, the solutions are not simply replacing coal with natural gas. It's not uh, increasing simply fuel efficiency in vehicles. That's a desirable thing. It's desirable to get coal off of the market. But the real solutions are moving into the 21st century with high efficiency, modern technologies, heat pumps, uh, electric vehicles, things of that sort, and using renewable energy. And, and the White House doesn't yet seem to be there. We need to be there, given the role that methane plays in this short-term warming and the possibility of, of uh, just hugely damaging the planet if we were to tip into a different climate system as we hit the one and a half to two degree mark over the next 15 to 35 years. I just want to add one other thing to what Bob just said, and that is, uh, from my perspective, um, we seem to still be practicing um, policy-based science as opposed to science-based policy. And we've now got ourselves painted into a corner where the only conceivable benefit of using natural gas uh, as a so-called transition fuel is to use it in replacement of coal for electricity generation. But that only works if the emission rate is low. And by low, we mean much lower than the measurements that are being made and much lower than previous calculations because of the factors that Bob pointed out in his presentation that the global warming potential of methane is much higher than we thought it was. And the actual emission rates are much higher than we thought they were. And we don't have 100 years to worry about the problem anymore. Uh, we have 15 to 35 years with business as usual, all the above, before we reach uh, the very strong potential for tipping points at that 1.5 to 2 degrees centigrade range. So we're in a very awkward position that scientists never like to be in. That is, we need to know a relatively small number, 1%, 2%, 3% leak rate, that is very sensitive uh, to small errors in that small number. Uh, if we're off by only 5 or 10 percent, uh, the so-called advantage for natural gas over coal, the immediate advantage, can disappear for decades. So we're in a very awkward position. We don't know what that small number is. We will never know exactly what that small number is, but we do know that the policy implications 
of that small number are very sensitive. Uh, so we don't want to be putting the American people and in fact the people on the face of the planet in a situation where they're asked to take uh, a calculated risk on something so important. So thank you very much for all your attention today. We really appreciate your joining with us. Yes, thank you very much. Okay, thank you everybody. If there are no further questions, we will bring an end to the call. Um, I will be circulating a recording of the event, and there's been a request for a PDF of the slides, which I have a feeling we'll be able to provide as well. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.